Hello, and welcome to the Working Tools Masonic Podcast, where today we will be interviewing illustrious brother Al Jorgensen, Sovereign Grand Inspector General for, for the Scottish Rite in the Orient of Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that our opinions and thoughts are our own and do not reflect those of our Grand Lodge or respective craft or concordant bodies. Please connect with us and ask questions, either here on YouTube or on our Facebook page. We'd also appreciate a thumbs up and especially any comments on our videos. Thank you for coming back to the Working Tools Masonic Podcast, where today we will be interviewing who we would usually introduce as most worshipful brother, Al Jorgensen, who's the, the past grandmaster of Washington of uh, Masons here in Washington. But uh, for the purposes of today's discussion, he's illustrious brother, Al Jorgensen, because he is the, the Supreme, I knew I was going to do it, the Sovereign Grand Inspector General uh, for the Orient of Washington, the head of Scottish Rite here in Washington. So illustrious sir, welcome to our, our humble podcast. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, indeed. So, I guess my my our previous episode to this one was a, an interview with the the um, oh my goodness, the sovereign, sovereign grand commander, sovereign of, grand commander of Canada. I, apparently, it's not a good evening for titles here. I apologize of Canada. And so, I guess my the first question I asked him will will ask the same question here. How does one get to be sovereign grand inspector general for the Orient of Washington? What's the what was your career up to this point, Masonically? Well, Masonically, uh, primarily started through the Blue Lodge. However, I did have an Air Force career. And while I was in the Air Force uh, and stationed in Omaha, Nebraska, I took the Scottish Rite degrees, became a member of uh, the Valley of Omaha and uh, maintained my membership there until after I retired and moved back to my uh, home state in the state of Washington, where I'd had my Masonic affiliation with my Blue Lodge. I was active in my Blue Lodge and uh, after I was master of the lodge, became active in Scottish Rite again. And uh, through that uh, experience, uh, was uh, selected at one time to be the uh, personal representative of the Sovereign Grand Inspector General for the Valley of Tacoma. Uh, and off, out of that, uh, and having been elevated to uh, a, an Inspector General Honorary of our Supreme Council, I was uh, nominated uh, to the uh, Sovereign Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction. And uh, he in turn appointed me deputy of the Supreme Council uh, in, uh, well, I was actually in uh, December of uh, 2012. That following uh, August at the Supreme Council session, I was elected to the position of Sovereign Grand Inspector General for the Orient of Washington. So in a nutshell, that's sort of how it took place. And was this sort of in parallel with your, your progression through the Grand Lodge of Washington also, or were you... No, this was subsequent to that. Uh, I, I was involved when I, right after I retired in 93 from the Air Force, uh, came back and became active in my lodge, which I joined back in the mid 60s and uh, progressed through the chairs there uh, to become the master in uh, 1997. And then subsequently the deputy of the Grand Master and uh, served on some committees of the Grand Lodge and then uh, in turn was elected junior grand warden and progressed through the chairs there. And in 2005, 2006, uh, served as Grand Master. And uh, that, uh, at the conclusion of that, of course, you're always looking for work. So uh, that's when I started getting active again in Scottish Rite again and, uh, and progressed there. And not only Blue Lodge, most worshipful, like illustrious sir, but you were also a DMLA as well. And I know Steve will be appreciative of that as he was a DMLA member. And so you were in DMLA, weren't you state master counselor as well? That's affirmative. I was a uh, state master counselor so many years ago, but it was 63, 64, which was an interesting situation. Uh, the, uh, I wasn't good, even good, born then. Beg your pardon? <laughs> I wasn't even born then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hurt me bad. Hurt me bad. Okay. Um, the, uh, it was an interesting point that uh, the good brother that followed me through the chairs in the Grand Lodge here, uh, 
uh, illustrious brother and most worshipful brother, Chuck McQuarrie, happened to be the state master counselor of Oregon the same year that I was state master counselor of Washington. And uh, the interesting part about that is that we didn't do much with Oregon back in those days. Uh, our, uh, our interest was always working with the brothers from British Columbia. And we had a real close association between uh, the, the state master, the state of Washington and uh, the uh, province of British Columbia and uh, their grand, uh, grand chapter. So uh, Chuck and I got acquainted uh, in masonry as opposed to in Malay. Yeah, we had a lot of fraternal visitations going across into Washington uh, and Everett and uh, Everett was a big one for us. And so was Chuck in that chapter. Uh, in Demolay, it was we were so active going across that border, and they, they were so much fun down there too, right? Um, if memory serves me correctly, wasn't it uh, Everett who they all they had they made these planes and they flew them? Um, uh, that was their unique thing to their chapter uh, is that they had grown. Uh, it actually they grew so fast that they had to split off and become two chapters. And then they had to deal with the division of the planes and things like that. But it was it, it was so much fun. Uh, De Malay, uh, it had we had such great relations with Washington. So I, yeah. I, I remember that. And, and yeah, that's probably due to you guys' efforts. Well, I don't know about that. We, uh, we you know, having a, a function where the Brits were involved. We call them the Brits. The Canadians were involved. Uh, was always an, an an opportunity to let our hair down and really go crazy. So. We enjoyed visiting up there on several occasions. And of course, yeah, y'all visited down our place. Yeah. Yeah, my, my son is actually now a member of the Malay and Everett. So uh, Wait, William Jackson well. chapter in Everett. Well, I, I know our missing host, Connor Massey would uh, especially be missing this one because he was a provincial master counselor as well for British Columbia and Yukon as a D Malay. And uh, so he has that significant, and he's, he's probably on a similar track, I, if I had to guess, as a young man, he's on a similar track, uh, speedy track, <laughs> to higher offices in, in Grand Lodge, assuming his health maintains that. I uh, Most Worshipful, and I, I appreciated your story about Most Worshipful, illustrious Chuck McCurry. I was going to ask uh, if you had a story with him. Unfortunately, he passed just now a year ago. It's, I remember seeing his anniversary come up there, and we certainly miss him. And I know that you had a wonderful relationship with him, and he followed you in the chairs, and I was curious about a uh, I, I had forgot that he was master counselor of Oregon. I had forgot about that. What a neat, what a neat friendship there. Well, he was a beaver believer. You know, and so we used to have a lot of fun with that being a Oregon state and Washington state. Uh, we, uh, we often uh, had a few bets that uh, caused a few different drinks to get, uh, get taken care of, but uh, yeah, that was a great relationship. And so did, you, did you end up joining Masonry directly right out of DMLA and continue on, or, or what? My my experience and how I got into Blue Lodge was uh, uh, back in the days when <clears throat> when I took my degrees in Masonry, you didn't ask anybody or even talk to anybody about the fraternity. And my father was a past master of the lodge and, and that sort of thing. So he didn't talk to me. He was very active in supporting me in DMLA and that he was that advisor and chairman of the advisory board and things like that. But uh, we now can join masonry at 18 here in the state of Washington. Back then you had to be 21. So uh, when, I, uh, when I turned 21, didn't hear anything from my dad, but my mom walked up to me and handed me a petition and she said, uh, there's a check inside, fill it out and give it to your dad, okay? It's all taken care of. <laughs> and so my mother's the reason that I got started right away in masonry. Uh, you know, it was an intent to do that, but uh, uh, she was the, the prime motivator on the timing. And did you follow your dad's footsteps and, and become active in the advisory council and so on afterwards? I was, in, I was on the advisory council of the DMLA uh, not in in uh, in that time frame, but after I retired, when I came back from uh, uh, and retired back in my home area, uh, I did become involved in the advisory board of uh, the same my, my home chapter. And I think uh, Brother Colbeth, the very wish Brother Colbeth, is the chairman of the board now, if I'm not mistaken. There, and so uh, yeah, he uh, we both share that ex 
experience, not that I was chairman of the board, but I was on the advisory council for a while. So, so you've had that, uh, that distinct pleasure and feeling of, of the opportunity to give back that which you received as a young man. It, it, that, I, I tell you, man, there's nothing cooler than that for me. Uh, yeah. uh, like yeah. Dave, I, I had girls. I didn't have any boys uh, uh, in my uh, first marriage. I, I had girls, and, and I still gave all my, my uh, time to the council and, and D. Malay. Um, uh, it was just so rewarding, right? So I, I can yeah. relate. I, my, my, grand, my daughters, uh, with my military movement or career, uh, we were moving quite a bit, uh, 17 moves in about 27 years. Uh, so they didn't get an opportunity to, uh, one of the, one location, my oldest daughter had a chance to go up through the line and, and Job's daughters uh, got as far as senior princess and we had to, we had to leave. And so she didn't get to go on to be honored queen. My other daughter was active in rainbow at one of the locations, uh, did not uh, get to the elected line, but she was an, an officer in the, in the uh, assembly. So I, was involved with Rainbow and Job Stoddard's on advisory boards and, and advisory councils in the, in their time frame, but not in DMLA and any of the locations I was at. So it was really a, much more comfortable when I was dealing with the boys when I came back, and and uh, except that uh, they were so young and I was so old, so uh, they had me really going pretty good. Yeah, but you know you can speak to them from a level that they would understand. And, you know, I know that that made a real big difference uh, in my time going through DMLA, uh, being able to connect with the advisors, um, you know, and having been a DMLA, uh, th that gives you that, that, that different kind of bond and connection with the brother because you're still their brother at the same time, right? Well, it, it is, you know, that is true. And, and it's interesting, the, the young men that come into masonry from DMLA uh, have a much better acclimation uh, to the fraternity than the brothers coming that uh, have studied us on the internet and, and come that way. Although they're very well read, uh, having done the ritualistic work in DMLA and that sort of thing. Uh, they, the young men that we get from DMLA are much more comfortable, I feel, at least initially, uh, coming to us. Oh, yeah, my, uh, definitely, definitely. And, uh, you know, it's kind of cool. Uh, you know, I, I look at the panel and you and myself and David, uh, we've, we've done a lot of the similar things there uh, our, with respect to our girls and supporting them and Job's daughters and, and as well as being involved in DMLA um, and, and masonry. Uh, David's gone a little further than myself in, in that. I've not been to uh, uh, the, the, the level of being a district deputy grandmaster with all that wisdom and knowledge, um, <clears throat> and uh, or, or definitely not as far as you're talking about the same guy now. Wait a minute, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, right? You know, and, and, and you know, the really cool part is, is if he doesn't know something, he knows somebody who does, right? And uh, so a very resourceful kind of guy. Yeah, look, right? See? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, a most worshipful brother, uh, Jorgensen, uh, you know, being well connected to Brother Colbeth. I mean, we're, I mean, how else do we think we got you on here? Well, you, will, you know, I, I, I have some responsibility, I think. I, I think I did sign his petition to join the lodge. So, uh, And no matter how hard I tried to get him to join another lodge, he insisted on joining uh, my lodge. So, now we know who to blame. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I lovingly joke that it's all his fault. I, Al does have the distinct uh, distinction of being the second Mason I've spoke to in Washington. And uh, it, it was, it was a sincere pleasure from the beginning. I, I absolutely consider him a mentor and appreciate all the help he's given me throughout my Masonic career and the future as well. So. It's awesome. And to have that connection, uh, uh, I'm, it's going to be great for, uh, many years to come, uh, I'm sure of it. Um, can I ask uh, your your years uh, when you went to uh, the most worshipful grandmaster? Uh, you know, what was uh, the thing that stood out for you, or or, or the thing that you uh, had most impact on in your year? Well, we uh, we had a really outstanding. Well, all our grand past grandmasters were outstanding, but we had 
one that had a great deal of foresight as we moved into the uh, new millennium, if you will, and uh, set about to establish a strategic plan for the Orient of Washington, or not the, the jurisdiction of Washington, back in 1999. He said, oh, where do you think we're going to be uh, in the year 2010, 2015 in masonry? And uh, those of us that uh, sat around the table with him, you know, we're checking our belly buttons for Lent and things like that because we really didn't hadn't really thought about it a great deal. We were just worrying about how we were going to get beans on the table for the next meeting and that sort of thing. But in any case, uh, he, uh, he asked that question and he said about to establish a planning uh, tiger team. And uh, that team put together an extensive plan. And it was fortunate and the brothers that preceded me in the Grand Lodge line all signed on to this strategic plan. And by that, I mean, <clears throat> Uh, we all had a time frame and a time reference in which we were to accomplish certain things. So we kind of knew in accordance with the plan, what we were, what we were to get accomplished when, uh, when we were sitting in the big chair. And so uh, my part of the plan, uh, you know, was uh, already laid out for me. Uh, we worked to uh, try and get and in greater involvement of the uh, of the master masons in Grand Lodge, and of course in in our Grand Lodge, and I'm not sure how it works in British Columbia, but uh, you know you have to either be a, a warden master or a past master to uh, have a vote at Grand Lodge. Yeah, that's the same here. But I th it, I thought it was important, and we thought it was important as part of our strategic plan to integrate our master masons to have them come to our annual communication and be part of that uh, to observe how the legislation is passed and, and the, the conduct of our uh, senior body in the state. And we had one of the, uh, the largest contingents of uh, participation at Grand Lodge that we'd had in about um, the, at least the last five or six years previous to uh, to the Grand Lodge, which we held when I was when I presided, so that was one of the things that we tried to do, and and I think we uh, were, were fairly successful in in getting brothers oriented and participating, and engaging them, uh, and that's one of the things that uh, was important in the period of time. We uh, we actually ran that plan, and we operated that plan for um, two thousand one through about two thousand nine. Uh, was the duration of that plan. And then uh, subsequent to that, uh, new plans were developed for, strategic plans were developed for the conduct of the Grand Lodge after that. But all the brothers that were in the line previous to me and subsequent to me uh, were on board with that and worked very hard to fulfill the items that we'd identified as goals uh, and uh, benchmarks for their respective years. And, and so um, that's pretty cool. How did you get everybody to, or the, the increased participation? Well, <clears throat> part of uh, making that happen was that uh, everybody in the, uh, the elected line knew that they had the, the environment was established uh, to enable them to begin to work on the items that they were going to be responsible for in the year that they sat in the, in the, in the Oriental chair. And so consequently, uh, when we all signed up to that, when we started this strategic plan, and as we worked through it, uh, there was uh, I guess the best way to put it is there was very little ego involved with this whole thing. It wasn't one of those things where I want to make my mark on masonry. And so therefore we're going to do this during this particular year. And, uh, and so we did, and we, we, with uh, the involvement of, of everybody from junior grand warden all the way up through deputy grand master and promoting the particular programs that were going to be highlighted during their respective year. It was, uh, it was an enabling to an out, to bring in a greater number of brothers to participate. I think that's how we did that. Um, 
it seemed to work that way. Well, that's pretty cool. And all that awesome experience has helped you become uh, more better prepared for Sovereign Grand Inspector General. Well, we'll see about that. You know, it's, uh, I'm still learning. I've only been doing this for about seven years now. So uh, uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. Uh, in uh, Southern jurisdiction of uh, Scottish Rite, uh, the Sovereign Grand Inspector General serves course, at the will and pleasure of the Sovereign Grand Commander, but uh, his job is good as long as he does his job and uh, he doesn't get elected out by the other members of the council or until he turns 80 years old. And I've, so I've got a light at the end of the tunnel there. At, le at least at 80 years old, I'm going to be retired for sure. But uh, if the boss doesn't fire me before then. So. Yeah, well, then I guess maybe the shrine will have a spot for you after that. <laughs> no, I think we've, uh, we will have done our our fair share in masonry with, uh, at the completion of this particular endeavor. I'm a member of the shrine. I love it dearly. And uh, uh, some of my best childhood memories are going to functions with my dad. He was a shriner. And uh, of course, everything at the shrine events back then when I was a kid, everything was for the kids. And so we could eat all the popcorn, candy, ice cream, and uh, all the... Uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, or whatever were, we, you know, and so uh, it was, uh, yeah, I had very fond memories and I made up my mind that if I ever became a Shriner that I was going to do it at uh, my dad's uh, Shrine Center. And uh, so after I retired and came back, I was able to do that. Oh, very cool. Nice to have the, that generational thing. Uh, that's a good question. How many generations of Masons are there in your family? As far as I know, uh, there are now three generations. So my dad was a was a master mason. Uh, of course, I'm a master mason, and I have a grandson that uh, I had the pleasure of raising, who was a master counselor of my chapter, and then he became a mason when he turned uh, 18, and uh, he's now pursuing a master's degree back at Michigan State University. And uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to take a road trip because he had to go back there this last, uh, well, the end of August, and uh, he had uh, a whole bunch of stuff that he had to, in a trailer and, and so forth. And so uh, we took, uh, hooked the trailer on the back of our pickup and we drove cross country. So we did a road trip, uh, a little over 2,400 miles each way and uh, took him back there to, uh, to East Lansing, Michigan. And uh, so we're keeping track on him, but uh, he's maintained his uh, Masonic affiliation with our my, our lodge, David, David's Lodge and myself. So, uh, yeah, we're three generations. Well, and, and not only on the men's side, too, but and we probably should have should consider having Nancy on the show at some point. Uh, I'm sure we could uh, accommodate a half hour's worth of conversation uh, with yeah. Nancy. Accommodate five hours of conversation with Nancy on the show. I can guarantee you that. But uh, <laughs> I, I will say it was it's it, you know how normally Masons as we talk about this show is just a kind of a conversation. We're just talking outside. It's interesting how normally Masons were their, their wives are begging them to leave, and it's so funny to see the juxtaposition with Al as he's inching towards the car and Nancy is uh, wonderful, wonderful, but she does enjoy her conversations. But I was going to say that there's been a little bit of a parallel as you've risen in the ranks. Uh, Nancy also was a chapter sweetheart at Highline chapter. That's how you met and you were in Dimole and she was in the sweetheart's chapter and you became man and wife, of course. And then she has risen through the ranks essentially of Eastern star too. And was in the grand lot grand. I don't even know the terms. I apologize. Of the Eastern star grand officer in the, in the grand chapter of Washington. Yeah. She was appointed officer. And so she had the opportunity to do that. And uh, she, uh, you know, she's been, uh, been there with our girls, two daughters, both of them in their, Job's daughter and uh, and Rainbow affiliations. So, uh, yeah, she uh, came through all that. And in fact, it was interesting. The first meeting I attended after I became a master mason was not a lodge meeting. I went to a Rainbow meeting where the young lady there that was the drill leader for the Rainbow Assembly happened to be the lady I was going to marry. She was my fiance at the time. So, uh, I, I don't. 
I don't know that we want to start having wives on here. We, we, I, I prefer to think of this as a bubble of, you know, that we're in. I don't want the truth coming and interrupting what, what That's goes funny. on. I was just having that thought. I wonder if we had a panel of, of wives of all these heads of these organizations, what that would sound like. Uh, you, you can be the intro for that one, Steve. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, uh, no, I'm good. Uh, and so, Al, you, you mentioned that uh, you had connect, done some connection with Scottish Rite while you were in the service, but I know there was not, you were pretty busy, of course, having a life and uh, two two master's degrees besides and raising girls and having your Air Force career. And so, you, you basically became a Master Mason and then shortly thereafter left for your mm-hmm. Air Force career. And so, what did the, what, what Masonic affiliations did you have or able to have at all during that time was there other than Scottish Rite degrees? Well, actually, that was about that was it. I, I did did manage to visit on a couple of occasions uh, in uh, my Air Force career in North Dakota and uh, in Texas and uh, uh, in uh, Nebraska, but uh, did not get active in any lodge or anything like that because uh, <clears throat> I was trying to build a career and, uh, and that kind of took precedent at the time. <clears throat> and we didn't have a, a, a set location where we were going to be. And as long as we were at any place was four and a half years. And <clears throat> most of the tours uh, were somewhere between a year and a half and uh, two and a half years. So uh, it doesn't make uh, for the opportunity to do that sort of thing. But uh, Did so. Is it a lot though? No. Uh, as I said, there, there were the, the three or four locations that we were at that I, I we did visit. My wife did get somewhat active in Eastern Star in one of the locations, but we were only there for a year. And so we didn't get that active, uh, but uh, we did make some great friends and uh, acquaintances while we were there in, in that particular organization. So, um, but I ran into a, a brother that I'd served with uh, at another location while I was in Omaha. And uh, he was, he had just recently joined the Scottish right there. And, uh, he uh, got me into the Sojourners at, in Omaha, and then subsequently uh, they were having a reunion for Scottish Rite, and so I had the opportunity to uh, go through the reunion there. And uh, the Valley of Omaha is uh, is a large valley, and I think in our class we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 60, uh, 60 candidates that went through the degrees that uh, a particular reunion that I was involved with. But shortly after that, I was transferred and so I didn't really get to enjoy my uh, my long association with with Omaha. It was interesting uh, when we had the Conference of Grand Masters in Omaha here about four or five years ago, I was able to go back and uh, <clears throat> the Scottish Rite hosted a, an event there for the Grand Masters were in town for uh, coffee and uh, drinks and things like that. So I got to go there and went through the pictures of the classes, and I found myself in in the class. My, I was a pretty handsome young man, but uh, that was a long time ago. So, but uh, yeah, so uh, that was really the one time or uh, that I had some real strong association and went through the degrees. It was uh, uh, three weekends that we went through Friday and Saturday uh, to go through the degrees. There they portrayed most of the degrees of, uh, of Scottish right. Well, and I, I definitely use that analogy when I'm talking with a young man or not even a young man, but just somebody that's looking to affiliate with masonry and they have any questions about moving away or even a Mason that's, uh, we just had one that had to move. He and his wife moved to Arizona recently and he was kind of just starting in the chairs and he was so disappointed. And I said, you know what? First of all, there's, there's, you're, you're a master Mason. You can go to any lodge you want to go to. You can be part of that down there, whatever. But hopefully we're going to do a good enough job that there'll be a lodge if you want to come back and do come back. There'll be a lodge here that you can participate in. And I said, you know, that guy, Al, and they all, oh, yeah, we know Al. Of course, Al. Everybody knows Al. Uh, <laughs> he, he had a, an extended uh, you know, disconnection from our lodge here. But look, look how he came back and look what he's done. Not that you have to do what he's done, but uh, – that's what masonry that's a, one of the beautiful things about masonry is that it's not one person they can you can travel and as we say travel in foreign countries and foreign states and foreign areas and 
hopefully the lodge will be there when you return, or if not this one, a lodge should be there when you return and you're able to plug in and be involved as much as you want when you get back. You know, that's one of the things uh, that I clung to, if, if you will, in, uh, when I was in the service. It, uh, I found that uh, how many times have you known somebody that, you know, who is a Mason who just hasn't taken the degrees? And, uh, and so consequently, if you can be a Mason and not be active as long as you conduct yourself as a Mason, uh, I ran into a number of uh, brothers in, in the service uh, who, uh, by, by virtue of the way that they conducted themselves, you almost knew that they were Masons and come to find out that many of them were. Uh, the other thing that, that I maintain now is that fraternity is a very patient, uh, patient, patient fraternity. That by that, I mean, uh, when you're ready to become active in it, it's ready to accept you and put you to work. And that was my, my experience. Uh, obviously, I couldn't get active in it when I was busy in the service. But once I got out and came back to my lodge, I was only, went, I think of my second meeting, and all of a sudden I was on the temple board. And uh, the next installation, I had a, you know, an appointed office. So uh, they were ready to put me to work as soon as I showed some interest. So that was wonderful. Yeah, that's something that Masons are really good at. As soon as you show interest, we got some work for you. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, you know, the saying goes, many hands make lighter work. So if you are interested in, in participating, um, at, at least uh, there's many of us to share the load. You bet. So uh, I think we've about reached the end of our, our time for this episode of uh, for the Working Tools podcast. The... Uh, uh, so I'd like to hope, uh, illustrious sir, that you're willing to, to hang around for another episode and, and we can, uh, discuss some of your, the operations of the, I'm having trouble speaking this evening, the Scottish right here in Washington, uh, and, um, uh, and go, go further down that road. But for now, on behalf of, uh, David Colbeth and Stephen Chung and myself, uh, illustrious brother, Al Jorgensen, the sovereign grand inspector general for the Orient of Washington. Thank you very much for coming on the working tools podcast this, today. And uh, thank you all for listening. And we look forward to, to putting out another episode next week of the Working Tools Podcast. Goodbye. Thank you, brothers.